Hello and welcome to Let's Talk Sports. I am Ralph Lavella. And I'm Ron Sen. Well, oh, if I could be commissioner of baseball, to have the opportunity to make the decision about who gets suspended, how long they get suspended for, what they get suspended for. Take Ryan Dempster. Ryan Dempster intentionally hit Alex Rodriguez. First of all, he missed him three out of four. So how good is he? And then he finally hit him, and he gets a lousy five-game suspension. I would have given him a 50-game suspension. Maybe a 100-game suspension would have been better, at least if you were a Red Sox fan. If Dempster never pitched again for the Red Sox, it would be too soon in my judgment. Yeah, you hear about uh, you hear Ortiz st sticking up for uh, A-Rod and kind of knocking Dempster. He says he's a good guy, but... In a pennant race, he should have never have done that. We're up to nothing. Well, I agree. It is but a that's a bunch race. of crap by Ortiz, though. Go ahead. Well, in a pennant race, why are you giving away outs? Of all people, Dempster is not a guy who can afford to give away outs. And the Yankees were down 2 to nothing. They were nice and sl sleeping. They have been kind of out of it. And the Red Sox woke them up. And the Yankees have played really good baseball lately. Yeah, but Dempster's making a statement for just about all the players are doing it the right way. You know, I mean, he's been a joke to baseball. He's hurt baseball, A-Rod. He's making millions and millions of dollars. Pitches, you know, that he's hit home runs against, had big, you know, great at-bats again, against. He's hurting them. And Dempster just wanted to make a statement that, you know, we're fed up with this. Well, I understand that. But if we, if we had intentional injury or unethical play against every guy in sports who wasn't a nice guy, we'd never see a game. We'd just see people banging on each other. Yeah, what other. about Bob Gibson? What about Bob Gibson? He would have been Ortiz the first time Ortiz got the bat and flipped it after a home run. The next time up, you know the pitch was going at his head. There's this famous story about Don Drysdale. Manager comes out and says, you know, I want you to give this guy an intentional walk. Drysdale says, forget that. He just hit him with the first pitch. But that's been going on forever. I mean, people are knocking them stuff for doing it. I mean, he right. threw at him twice. The, the second and third pitch, where they were inside. He wasn't thrown at him. But the first pitch, he threw at his knees. Right. You can't now... I know you've pitched, I pitched. I never threw a ball behind a player ever, you know, in however many years of pitching from Little League through uh, college and inner city league. You know, it's just, it's just like, it's not easy to hit a left-handed batter if you're a right-handed pitcher, especially if you, th it, because your ball doesn't move that way. So when you see a guy throw behind a lefty, you know it's intentional. And right-handers most of the time, occasionally you get the Daniel Bards of the world who have no idea where the ball's going. It's not. You know, they had to take Bard out last year because he'd, he'd walked five guys, hit two, thrown wild pitches. He just had, you know, he had a meltdown. But I have to give Dempster credit. He didn't throw at his head. He threw up. The last pitch was up near his shoulder, but it wasn't at his head. Remember when Piazza hit the two home runs against Clemens? Remember when he got up again? Right. He got beamed. That's what I can't stand when they throw at their head. But he was just trying to make a statement to A-Rod is that you're ruining the game. You're making a joke of the game. We don't like it. And I'm going to hit you. Up near the shoulder, not in the head, so big deal. The, the guy that ticks me off is Ortiz. Well, I, I understand what I understand what the message was. I just don't agree with it. Well, what do you think you about know? Ortiz coming out, you know, sticking up for A-Rod, well, saying we shouldn't have a choice? I mean, that's the biggest bull, Ortiz saying that we're in a pennant race. Well, Ortiz could c care less about the pennant race. A-Rod's his friend. Well, it's true, you know, and... and once upon a time, there were no friendships across the lines, and, and the game's changed a whole, whole lot since then. Jeff was talking about seeing the movie 42. I, I don't know if you've seen 42 no. yet, but certainly when Jackie Robinson came into the baseball, talk about going through a lot. Now, obviously, whatever they showed in the, in the movie was a tiny fraction of what he actually had to put up with. But through this whole thing, the, the one person I do not like is Ortiz. Well, I, I don't think he's truthful. I think, I mean, when he broke into the, meet, the interview that um, Frank Conan was having, because they took one of his RBIs away, when he busted the phone, when he could have put a splinter into, Pedroia. into Pedroia's neck, what would happen then? Well, the worst guy throughout it all has been Ryan Braun, who you know, went out of his way, could not deny enough, and try to besmirch the character of try to get other guys. Right, tried to say that the uh, guy was anti-Semitic, and then how dare they question his character. They say he's going to apologize. I don't, understand. I don't even see how anybody could even care about any apology well, from Braun. Well, he's no good, Braun. He's just, he's just no good. You know, I don't put Ortiz too far behind him, I'm telling you. Well, and you see, difficult situation. You know, I, I don't know how much to go into this, but obviously Jerry Remy's kid, it's not Remy's 
problem, but Remy's had a lot of health problems of his own, and his son obviously, uh, you know, is in custody for murder, and, uh, you know, we don't have to go into the legal ramifications at it, but how, how do you get in situations, and it seems like we hear news about this more and more, about um, violence, athletes and others. That should have never happened. You know, I, I know what happened there. You know, when you talk about the legal system, he should have never been released. He shouldn't right. have been released that night by the bailiff. He should not have been released when he went to court. He should have been held for a dangerousness hearing. I heard it was a, a, a young DA that made a decision because she didn't appear. She came in for the restraining order the night before, emergency restraining order that a judge gives when the court's not in session. They call the judge. And if he feels that he's, you know, they have enough information, then he'll, he'll give it to you until court. But that restraining order that you get, the emergency restraining order, they tell the people if you want to extend, you have to go to court at 9 o'clock in the morning. But that restraining order is good till 4 in the afternoon, the emergency one. Right. And mm -hmm. she never went. And then I heard that um, Remy's wife called her to ask her not to go extend the restraining order that her son, you know, wanted to see the kids. I don't know if that's true. Right. Well, but, and, and we see hard to believe information. For example, the case of Stephen Rhodes, a walk-on, probably special teams player at Middle Tennessee State. He served in the Marines, I guess, for five years, and now he's going to try out for Division I football team. He's not going to be an impact player. He's going to be a famous player, and the NCAA, in all their wisdom, they cannot do enough things wrong, decided initially to, to not allow him to play because he'd played some uh, organized football in the Marine Corps, which I'm sure it wasn't exactly what they had in mind. They were going to deny him, allow uh, to, to play this season and make him sit out a year or two. And then finally, after heavy pressure from all over, especially the internet, then the NCAA backed down. The kid's a walk-on athlete who served his country for five years on foreign shores, and the NCAA decides to stick up for silly rules. What was it, a semi-pro league? It was, it was some military league that he was playing in. You know, they had uniforms and officials. Well, how else do you play games without uniforms and officials? Well, now, you know, now anyone who does that in the future will be able to play right. in college. Apparently back around 1980, there was um, a rule that, that military personnel had an exemption. And as the it got carried forward, that rule got dropped. The intent was probably still there. The, the NCAA cannot go out of their way enough to look silly. I know, and they were selling, um, I mean, they, they've changed a few things in the last month or two, you know, especially with um, selling shirts and helmets and everything else, shoulder pads, they're selling everything. Now they stopped doing that, so I don't know how long. Right. Now, obviously, we've coached for a long time, uh, multiple sports, in fact, and I thought it'd be worthwhile to talk about what qualities you look for in a player. Obviously, there are the, the easy things, the size and strength and height, depending on the sport. But those are superficial. What, what you really look for in the individual that separates them out from their peers. Now, there's going to be a lot of different qualities, but I'd, I'd be interested in hearing what you think before I say anything. Well, number one is commitment. You've got to be committed. I mean, if you have a player that shows she's committed, right? you can tell. When you start drilling, you, you know, going through drills, you can tell if they're committed or not. The group we just had, I remember them in the fifth grade, it'd, get, it'd be dark at night, their parents would be waiting, they'd want to do another drill. I mean, you knew they, those girls were committed right from the beginning when we weren't sure we were going to be coaching the team until we saw if we had enough girls that were going to be committed to the program. And again, you pick that up right away. Right. You can sum that up under attitude. The players with great attitude who bring energy and enthusiasm and uh, really love to play the game it's not work to coach them, it's enjoyment. And I always say, I'm looking for players who, after they've finished in our program, they hope they can uh, coach someday. And in fact, one of our players, Caitlin, her mother, sent me a note saying she can't say how much she loves basketball and that someday she looks forward to coaching girls in basketball. Mm -hmm. that's, that's really what makes you happy when somebody really shows that kind of commitment to what they're doing. Yeah, I read that too. Um, well, she's a great kid. I mean, every yeah. one of the girls, I mean, every girl we had on our team was just unbelievable. I mean, we've had good experiences throughout in all the years we've right. coached. I mean, the girls, girls are special. I mean, when they, when they especially go out for a team, 
where they have to make the team. I mean, they feel, and when they make the team, it's like, I mean, it's the biggest thing in the world to make a team. It's, and, and they show their commitment. And uh, this group here, though, we had 11 girls that just loved playing with each other, hanging around together, and they were just totally committed. And when you have that, and you have that desire, I mean, there's no better feeling because they want to get, they welcome you pushing them. Right. And the, another important quality for athletes is discipline. Discipline to me means doing the things that need to be done when they need to be done and the right way they need to be done. So when, when people, we don't have people run for the sake of running. You run so that you can have energy to play defense the whole game. That during the, the latter stages of the game, you have more conditioning than the other team. That your legs are in better shape so your shots don't end up short. So people who enjoy the running because they understand what the goal of the teaching and the program are, those are the players that you really enjoy coaching. Yeah, and conditioning is, is huge. I mean, that to me, you've got to be, especially in basketball, you have to be in great shape to play basketball at the level and the type of basketball that we like to coach, up-tempo. You have to be able to, we tell our girls, you should be able to run the whole game if you have to, especially when you get into high school. You know, if you're one of the stars in the team, you don't want to sit down on the bench. You want to play just about every minute. And that's the way you should be thinking. You know, I mean, you, you shouldn't want someone to come in for you after a few minutes because you may be tired. You have to get in great shape. And if you're in great shape, you're able to play the up-tempo. If you're not, then you have problems. All right. Obviously, something else is important is about being a great teammate. Not everybody is going to be a great player. I mean, so, the word great is overused. I mean, if somebody's all scholastic or all state, I mean, I think that sort of speaks for itself. Somebody thinks they're a really accomplished player. But we tend to overuse great. But you can have a great attitude and add value to the team. We have players on our team who are, even if they never played, would br they bring so much by encouraging their teammates, by uh, sticking up for them, for, for really being supportive when they're sick or injured, that it's wonderful to have them around, and you know they'll be lifelong friends. Yeah, and you, you, know, you have to have the right coach, too, because I've seen teams, I've seen teams where the girls, where one girl could care less about the rest of her teammates. She just wanted to get her numbers. Tremendous basketball player. I mean, I've seen that in high school, and the coach kind of looks the other way. He knows that some of the girls don't want to play. I've seen teams where some of the girls don't want to play in the same team. They don't enjoy it. They go through their four years basically unhappy, but they have a star player here. You know, what is he going to do? How is he going to handle her? So that he just lets it go, and he ends up winning a lot, but he has unhappy players, well, and, and you see that a lot. Shea Petty had a coach growing up, Shawanda Brown, and Shawanda and her husband Eric were very much into having the players play team ball. And I remember being at a game, and one of the players took a couple of, I won't say ill-advised, they were just selfish shots, and she took the girl out, she sat her down and simply said, that's not how we play. And the girl got the message, you know, you, you sit down, you don't, you don't go back in and, because that's not how we play. And the, that's the, the ultimate power of the coach is to sit players who don't cooperate. Right. I mean, that's a key. I saw one game where Merrill's lost. They had a, a long, I'm not going to say with team, they had yeah. a long winning streak going and they lost at home against a team they should have beat because one player wouldn't pass the ball to another player. And then the real good player didn't get the ball back from the other player. They lost by one point. She knew she was open, but she wasn't going to pass her the ball because she never passed her the ball. I mean, I've seen that in high school. I mean, I haven't seen it lately, you know, but I've seen it years ago on a very good basketball team. So you have that too. You know, but the, you, know, you have these girls that we've seen in high school. I mean, you, you start for, with um, Jill McGinnis, who to me, again, should be the captain of the team. I mean, you, girls like her, I mean, you're just totally committed to you know, winning, playing the best they can play. And, and you see that up there. You see our class. You see the sophomore class oh, that well, those kids just want to do the best they right. can. You hear people talk about, oh, the players quit on the coach. And I would almost guarantee you that any time that happens, it was the coach who quit on the players, not the players who quit on the coach. Well, the coach quits on the players before they quit on him. Well, that's what I mean. It yeah. starts with the coach, not the other way around. You know, and then you have people that don't see it, and it goes on and on and on, and then it's a bad experience to some of the kids. I mean, that happens all over the place. Oh, no, from every... Not all. I mean, no. you look at Melrose. I mean, they have, like I said, they have a lot. Of, I mean, Chelly, because he's probably the best coach in the state in any sport, Coach Chelly. 
I mean, everybody who plays for him just loves playing for him. We got like 70 or 80 kids trying out for all three teams this year. You know, you have coaches like him and Morris. You know, I like Morris. He's a hard-nosed coach, you know, and you, you, you've, he, his teams are prepared. So I'm not – I'm just saying there are teams where coaches – just care about themselves and don't care enough about the players. Right, and I think as a coach, the first thing you, you want players who, who want to play for you, that are going to play hard, they're going to be competitive at all times, and bring your philosophy out to the floor. But the other thing is you want your players so well drilled and executing that people can say, any idiot can coach that team. Well, the answer, reason any idiot can coach that team is because they were so coached so that they can play together. Well, what happened two years ago when I was sick and you were on vacation? <laughs> and we had two of the parents coach the girls in a tournament up in North Andover. And they both told me after I came back, they said, we didn't have to coach them. They knew what to do in every situation. They were calling the plays out. I mean, when you have teams like that, but when you have teams where kids know you care about them, they'll do anything they can you know, right. to be successful. Well, we'll talk more about that. We'll be right back. You are a loser. Is that really news? Is that really something that people didn't know already, though? I mean, he, he admitted to roid use like four years ago. Or was it even roid use? Whatever it was. P-E-D? I don't know. You know what? You're a loser. The fact is, nobody liked you anyway, even long before that. Ten years ago, with your purple lips and your white hamburger helper gloves, the best thing that ever happened was Jason Veritek giving you a face wash with his glove. But I digress. There's nothing new here, nothing to see. Did you happen to read Joe Torre's book? Usually a manager might say a couple of things about people that played for him or played with him. He actually said that he had to go over and tell A-Rod, you know, maybe you might want to you know, instead of sending a handler for your coffee, maybe you should go get your own coffee. You know, blend in with the team a little more. He actually showed up the next day and say, look coach, I got my own coffee. Want to talk about Dents? His teammates don't like him. Case in point, before I get into the whole Ryan Dempster background, how about the fact that none of his teammates even left the bench? What does that say for you? If they liked him, they would have came flying out onto the field. Joe, I mean, Joe Girardi did because he had to. How would that have looked? Management doesn't want you on the field. They're trying to get out of your contract any way possible. Why they signed you for $250 million, I'll never know. But back to the Ryan Dempster bashing. Please. What code are we talking about here that he wasn't supposed to throw at him? It's okay to throw at a guy because he ran the bases too slowly or watched his home run lead the yard, but... We can't hit him because he's a cheater and the game wants him out? I mean, really? He actually called Dempster unprofessional. Really? What was slapping the ball out of a, base, a first baseman's hand against the Red Sox because you were, you were out, you were going to get tagged out with your hamburger helper gloves, but that didn't count? But anyway, back to the fact that A-Rod is a loser. You've been using drugs your whole career. You know, I think when I was a kid, George Foster, 52 home runs in 1977, and that was as close as anyone was going to get to that magical, mystical mark of Roger Maris's 61 home runs. Of course, A-Rod didn't have to threaten that because we had a parade of other cheaters that went and did that. 
but not for anything. A-Rod was supposed to be the guy that was going to break the all-time home run record of Hank Aaron. Of course, another cheater got there first, Barry Bonds, but we won't get into him. Bottom line is, A-Rod is washed up. He's not some 27-year-old kid who's almost on the cusp of greatness. He's yesterday's news. He's got something like 17 home runs in two years. He's got a ton of missed games because he's breaking down, and all the roids in the world can't save you, A-Rod. Okay? But hey, you know what? Bottom line, he's still playing right now, and as far as I'm concerned, every pitcher that stands on the mound ought to drill him in the rear end, which is where he was drilling himself with roids for the last, I don't know, 20 years. Personally, I stand here on a little league field and I say, you know, many little kids, they want to realize their dream, they want to grow up, they want to eat their Wheaties with calcium enriched milk, they want to start lifting weights and going to the batting cages with their fathers or their mothers. And you know what? That's how it ought to be. It shouldn't be that you got some punk who decides, you know what, I'm already great, but I want to be greater. But then again, that's what everybody else did, isn't it? Because this is the steroid era. And unfortunately for A-Rod, you are the face. And you're a loser. They don't even like you in New York. And we don't like you here. Bye-bye. Welcome back. Tonight is the Patriots' third exhibition game at Ford Field against the Detroit Lions. Now, any of you who remember two years ago at Ford Field, the Lions absolutely destroyed the Patriots. The Patriots looked like they'd never even seen a football before. Let's hope that doesn't happen again. But there's a lot of interesting battles shaping up on the team, and there could be some surprises down the line at numerous positions. What do you think, Ralph? Yeah, they're looking real good. I know that Brady's really excited about the team. He's excited about the young receivers. I think that defense, defense has a chance to be tremendous this year. If they're as good as I think they're going to be, you know, especially if Kelly it works out, Francis has a pretty good year, you know, Jones is looking good, Ninkovich, and Collins is, lo is looking real good, a linebacker. I hear, I hear that they're going to be doing a lot more things now with Hightower's second year, with Mayo, Spikes will be blitzing up the middle a lot more. Be putting a lot more pressure on the quarterback. Try to get in his face. You know what I feel about Wilfuck. He doesn't put enough, not tall enough, doesn't put enough pressure up the middle on the quarterback. So it looks pretty good. To lead, if he stays healthy, you know, he's been injured in the past. Right. I mean, Rashad Dowling, I mean, one of the most talented backs on the team, and he's always hurt. Well, I think that well, obviously injuries are huge, and you never. I mean, obviously, in, before the last week's game against Tampa Bay, the Patriots had a scare with Brady getting hit in the knee, but it turned out that he was okay. Why he wasn't wearing the new knee brace, I'm not really sure, but be that as it may. The, the difference I think I see in the limited time I've watched the games is that the, they seem faster. The whole team seems faster. Collins is really fast. And, you know, whenever you can play fast in a pass-happy league, that's going to be to your advantage. See how Wilson does, too, at safety. If he's a hitter, you know, the same with him and Spikes in the middle of the field. I mean, they're going to be doing a lot of hitting. There'll be a lot of fumbles, hopefully the, with the pressure, more interceptions. They're speaking ha highly of it. Arrington, which is crazy to me. I just figure him as a, an average back. But they're gonna, I believe he's going to be covering the slot receiver. But they're, they're high in a couple of young Ryan they're high on, well, you know, from Rutgers. Well, the issues they had last year, regularly were inability to cover backs and tight ends out and hopefully with clowns and Fletcher back yeah he's looking good you right. know what we think about Fletcher and then of course the Ravens lost Dennis Pitt on their tight end so, so that might be an issue for them you know but there's a lot of key battles shaping up one of those as you mentioned is in the in the secondary um, we don't know what Dennard's situation is because he has to go to court in September, I think. Hopefully Ryan wins that. Yeah, he's going to go, and he may, um, right. he may get six months. Who knows? And the NFL can't suspend him beforehand because he hasn't been convicted of anything. You know, so we'll, we'll find out on but that. But they love it. They like Ryan. I know Belichick was speaking highly of Ryan. They like that other. Or oh, Harmon. Sa yeah, he's a safety. Though. Right, you Duran have, Harmon. You got Wilson there. You have Gregory there. You, you have McCourty there. He's been out. But they have strong... They're strong at safety. They're real strong at linebacker. You know, if Kelly's as good as everybody says he is and Jones has improved, I mean, Rod, who knows? I mean, they have the chance to be great. Well, the they big, have the chance. The big battle they keep talking about is Mesco versus Allen at punter. To me, 
so far, I mean, I don't know what Allen's looked like in practice. I'm sure he's kicking the heck out of the ball because he's a talented guy. But in the games, he hasn't looked that great so far. It doesn't matter who they pick. I mean, the other guy's going to get picked up right away. Right. Are you kidding me? Teams can't wait for this. Oh, Here's oh. our punter. You know, the teams that don't have great punters. Here's our punter. We're gonna There's got to be like 10 teams waiting. Right. And, and the Patriots are not on any kind of threshold of salary problems. And I can't believe the Kraft... You know, another million dollars to him. Well, that's what the Chump difference change. is. Mesco will be making a million point. Four, point. I think, yeah. But, you know, if I were him, I'd want, I'd want to be cut. He'll make more if they cut him. Yeah, he's going to have ten teams bidding on him. Well, to me, it's... Although Me they, yeah. Mesco's kind of a proven guy. He's, been, he's shown he can hold. And that he also is pretty good at dropping the ball inside the ten. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, Allen's a two-time Ray Guy winner. Guy isn't in the Hall of Fame yet, is he? I don't think he is. You know, which is, you know, it's, I mean, people say, why isn't a punter in the Hall of Fame? Well, I guess, you know, I, I guess the punters union hasn't been well represented. That offensive line looks real good, too, again. I mean, well, the biggest solid. problem is the right guard position Carly. where they have injuries with Connolly, and I think Cannon's been out some. Spytek is the backup tackle who's been he's playing guard. pretty good. Hey, he's a, he's a big dude. I mean, they have the best tackles in football, right? Well, Baltimore does, too. I mean, you have Solder and Palmer at tackle, you know, and you have Mankins and Conley if he's healthy. If you had to pick a surprise cut or two from the roster, do you have any ideas on who that might be? I, it won't be a surprise, but Cunningham, I think, will be cut. Yeah, I think Cunningham is one. I mean, enough's enough. And, and I, Rashad Dowling, even though he's talented, you got to cut him. Even though Belichick picks him first in this. So he's the first pick in the second round. Yeah, that, the old and everybody said, why are you picking him? He's always injured. The old saying that Belichick has, it's about two things in the NFL. It's about ability and durability. And Dowling just can't stay healthy. And, you know, and some, there are a lot of players who... Well, but even Dowling, you know, what are we, yeah, what are we doing mean, with him? Look at uh, the Red Sox had a guy years ago who was a pretty good player, played shortstop, second, third, Tim Nearing. He, he was good when he was out there. Well, Jed Lowry was good, Lowry. too. He, but he's still good. He's, yeah, he's doing really well for Houston, about one of the few players there. But, you know, he just couldn't stay on the field. But I love Lowry when he was with the Red Sox, but he was injured, too, so they got rid of him. But, no, right. we, we, well, we're going to. Well, I just wonder, it, I wonder if Leon Washington is going to make it because he's kind of limited. He's, he's a kickoff returner. That's I would much. not cut him. I mean, he's a kickoff returner, but they're gonna, instead of having the ball at the 20, 18, 19, 20 yard line every time. They'll have the ball at the 28, 29, 30. He'll pop one once in a while. And then Edelman will kick it and well, oh, right. return the punts. I don't want Edelman returning kickoffs because he's going to get hurt. But I mean, why, do you, why do you need all those backs anyway? They're going to keep um, all those, they're going to keep five backs. Well, obviously, the, we know they're going to keep Ridley, Vereen, and, well, we don't know, probably Bolden, you know, and, and, they and like Blunt. The, they like Blunt, but I mean Bolden and Blunt. Just keep one of those two. Right, they're they're and both. Keep Washington. They're pretty similar, and bo both of them have low salaries. And not a funny thing too is Ridley's Ridley's that same type runner, but he's not as big as right. Blunt. I, I just worry about the whole concussion thing. Ridley just took, took took such a bad hit in the in the championship game last year. But I think there's no one else in the team who comes close to Washington returning kickoffs. So don't you want to go back to put McCourty back there? You start one of your starting cornerbacks. To get the ball out to the three, he, he returned one punt all the way last year. Right. And I think 90% of the punts he returned, he didn't get to the 20-yard line. You want a guy like him, and you want a guy like Washington that can break it. All right. Now, who's first question? Who's going to play more games this year, Wes Welker or Danny Amendola? Not production, just play more Welker, games. Of course, Amendola's no. already injured. All right. I'm going to take Amendola. I'm going to go for the upset there. Welker's already out with a sprained ankle, and my thinking is that Peyton Manning is kind of notorious for throwing into traffic. He's, he's a great quarterback. He's got um, the ability to get it into tight spaces. But look at a guy like Austin Cawley who's had a bunch of concussions but because Manning led him into trouble. And, and, you know, all quarterbacks can do it at times, but, you know, I, I think Welker's taken a lot of big hits. Yeah, but look at all the other receivers Manning's thrown to. I don't see many of them sitting out. Yeah. I mean, it's one player. But um, Welker, yeah, I know you're saying that they got rid of him at the perfect time. He's 33, Amendola's 28. Uh, I told you last show that I like Amendola with um, Edelman. I said you got Edelman backing him up, so they're in pretty well, good shape. Well, and the there. question is, if if Amendola, if 
one of the criticisms of Brady was that he got too locked in on Welker. Well, if he gets too locked in on Amendola, it's the same thing. But you know the good thing about Amendola? He can play split, uh, split receiver. Welker will play just in the slot. Amendola can go deep. He's quicker. He's faster. They're about the same in quickness. Right. I think of the receivers they have right now, I think Boyce is probably the fastest. Now, like, They're speaking highly of him. Yeah. He, he, got, he missed the spring session because of injuries, but he's back. I mean, probably we'll see him tonight. And, and uh, Ken Brell Tompkins, kind of a unknown, looks like he's going to be a starter at this point. Yeah. And, um, you know, with Brady, he's so smart, Ron. I mean, he's, if they go to five receiver package, you know someone's going to be open. What I didn't like at times last year, when you're sending five players out or four players out, a lot of times Brady would just look to one side and then try to drill it in if that player wasn't completely open. And then you see players on the right. I mean, when they start a replay, they're wide open. He's not even looking at them. But I think now with Welker gone, especially with Gronkowski not playing too, he'll be just trying to look at, look at the whole field and, and go to the open receiver. You'll see a little different. He won't be keen on one player. Right. They were, look, they were discussing this week on... Uh, Felger and Maz about which players were most admired on different teams. And not surprisingly, Brady was the most admired player from among New, New England fans. Will uh, fought uh, close second. I know. But Gronkowski admired? He's kind of a... He's a kn knucklehead. I told you what he did. Yeah, he I agree. With, I mean, he's an outstanding football player. And you might admire his abilities as a football player, but as a, as a person, he's kind of, uh, you know... Lower echelon. But I love, I love these younger players, you know, the tight ends and the receivers. They love, you know, their first year trying out for the Patriots, pro football, and they have Brady leading them. You could see it in their eyes when they're talking how proud they are to be playing with Brady. And this well, Patriot you got to think that, you know, all these guys are, by the time they get to their next contract, you know, Brady will probably be gone. But if you have a couple of big years because you play with Brady, it's got to help you when contracts roll around again. Yeah, I mean, it didn't help welcome. <laughs> well, you know. But he was older. You know, when they look at 33 years old compared to if he was 26. Right. Who wouldn't, who wouldn't, it'd be really great to be 33. But in the NFL, when you're 33, you're lucky if you can still walk. Yeah, and especially all the hits he's taken. I was on vacation once at a beach in the Caribbean, and I, my wife sees this guy who's monstrously big guy, and he's just limping down the beach like every step was killing him. So my wife went up to his wife and said, Excuse me, ma'am, your husband is enormous. Is he a professional athlete? And uh, she said, yeah, he plays offensive line for the Vikings. So I went up to him and said, you know, excuse me, I don't want to bother you on vacation, but you look like it really hurts a lot. And he said, oh, it does. <laughs> <laughs> so he was 35 years old. And just to walk up and down the beach, he was in agony. Yeah, I mean, they go through so much. I mean, and, and compared to the money these other players are making in basketball and baseball, and these guys, I mean, when they're, when they're done playing, I mean, even right. guys like Brady are going to be aching and hurting. Right. And, you know, at least the linemen, they probably can't get as, you don't get a full steam hitting the guy in the head, or mm -hmm. unlike a running back or uh, receivers. Well, what do you look for from the Patriots? What do you, what do you look? I mean, what do you, well, I think are that you high on them? Yeah, I think if, the, if, you know, people talk about balance. To me, balance isn't passing offense versus running offense. It's Balance means the defense can get the other team off the field. They can stop the third and eight, the third and four. I mean, the Patriots have been really terrible at stopping other teams' passing games and especially third and long. I tell you, again, the key to the Patriots is on third downs, keep Will Falk off the field. I'm talking about third and passing situations. If it's second and long, get him off the field. I'm telling you, they'll be a lot better. What's wrong? I mean, if Kelly works out and some of those younger guys work out, what's wrong with putting spikes in there at times? Move him onto the line of scrimmage. He's tough. He'll get penetration. He's not as big. He's quicker, and will, quicker, not that quick, but quicker coming to the quarterback. You know, and, and have him blitz. Uh, you know, maybe go to three, three down linemen and have him blitz every time up the middle. Well, it's tough to get to the quarterback. I think Brady was sacked, I want to say, 23 times last year, which isn't very many. But if you get in his face, it's a, that's what you want. Right. You know, and most teams, if you can get that middle rush, make the quarterback move. Sure, you got the guys from, uh, you know, the Michael Vicks, the RG3s that are real mobile. But, you know, a lot of the, you know, the guy, uh, Matt Ryan, he's, I mean, he's mobile, but 
you know, clearly he'd rather throw from the pocket than running around. But I tell you, that's the key. To me, that is the key. In passing downs, Will Fark is they have to keep him on the sideline. Well, every quarterback it kills him, Ron. It yeah, kills him. Every right quarterback, away. when you get, I don't care who you are, if if you get great penetration, the guy's going to be inaccurate because he's got to get rid of the ball. He can't look downfield. And when you're looking downfield and you got someone small coming up the middle, you can. I mean, he's not getting in your face. He's not even getting in your vision. You know, when you're looking down. Well, look what happened against the Giants back in the Super Bowl when the Giants had Pierre Paul and other guys. Uh, Michael Strahan, who are really tall, and they get his hands up really tough to, to find the receivers. Yeah, in Detroit. <laughs> Let's see what happens tonight with Brady in Detroit because they're, they're tall, and they get their hands up. And, you know, a lot of times you're looking downfield and you got to get it between two hands. And the guy with the greatest na nickname in football is not going to be playing tonight for uh, Detroit. Calvin Johnson, Megatron. <laughs> but they were talking about Matthew Stafford, and he's – He's a lot better than people give him credit for. You know, he's kind of fallen he down to a middle-of-the-road quarterback, but you know, I think he can still put up some numbers. Yeah, I mean, it's, it should be a good game tonight, but hopefully Brady doesn't get injured, plays maybe into the third quarter. This is the game where they play the most, the starters. Right, right. they'll probably so. play at least a half. And you know, we'll, we didn't really talk much about Tebow. He was beyond unimpressive during the last game. Now, Belichick was intimating that, look, he's playing with backup players, guys aren't always open, you know, whatever. One for seven with a zero quarterback rating is not much you can do worse but than that. You know what's amazing, though, Ron? With all, all the time he has spent all summer throwing the football and some of those passes he's throwing, it's like he doesn't have any clue. Right, you're throwing a 20-yard out, and it's not even hitting the receiver in the body. It's like five yards in front of him on the ground. But you just he, say, like, you could throw it closer than that. He was great in college. He had unbelievable stats. I don't know. Maybe he's too muscle-bound because he's, he's a big guy. They had a down, he threw it down and out. He threw it in the dirt. Like, but <laughs> know what I was listening to one of the shows today? They said if you see the pitches from above, it's even worse. Well, it was worse. He was rolling out to the left. I think it was Sudfeld. Could not have been more wide open. It was like he was invisible. But he threw a pass the first game to Sudfeld down, down the middle. Down the good pass. Just, a little, just off his fingertips. Right. But when I'm hoping, I like him. No, he's, I'm hoping he has a he's, stay even place tonight. I think he'll make the team. He's a really good person. You know, he'd, you'd be proud to have your daughter dating the guy. You know, so he's never going to be in any scandal. So it, it's hard to be too hard on him. Yeah, he ran, he's been running the ball pretty good, too. So We'll be right back. On and off the court, Visionary Basketball Group delivers programs that empower players with skills for athletic and personal success. Hello, my name is Anthony Taylor, founder of Visionary Basketball Group, VBG. It's a year-round basketball player development organization ranging from preschool to college and professional level, girls and boys. We cater to all skill levels, starting from beginner, beginner intermediate, and advanced. VBG for about a year now and I've gotten much better since I started and my team just went to nationals and we placed eighth in the nation. Uh, the Skills and Drills program here has been phenomenal. All day long he can come and uh, get an hour workout or more if he wants and um, his game has completely changed over the course of the year. Our players undergo learning experiences that position them for positive lifelong achievement on and off the court. With a year-round training philosophy, VBG can assist you in reaching your full potential as a player with conditioning, basketball fundamentals, position-specific training, and skills and drills taught by the best coaches in New England. One of the biggest things that we have is our coaching staff, who do a phenomenal job at mentoring the players on a regular basis with the training, the teaching, and the knowledge. We operate seven days a week. We offer over 30 sessions. And we're considered one of the top comprehensive basketball player development organizations in New England. VBC has just helped me grow as a player so much. They really have good attention to detail and that helps you with just the little things that not a lot of other schools and teams like really think about. VBC it helped us with our handles, our defensive skills, um, our confidence. Hi, I'm Lucas. Uh, I'm from Germany. I'm here for two months and 
I work on my game to get to a college in Boston. DBC has motiva motivated me to become the strong, independent, um, not just player, but student that I am. I've been playing at VBG for three years, and it's made me a better basketball player. Hi, my name's John, and I've played for VBG for three years now, and it's made me a much better basketball player. And my team just recently went to Dowden, Virginia, and we came in eighth uh, at Nationals. And another key aspect that we do is that we have kids coming from all different areas, urban, suburban communities, uniting as one. And that's what makes VBG a phenomenal uh, organization that helps kids gain confidence, leadership, discipline, self-esteem. And if you have a chance, come down and see what we do at Visionary Basketball Group. For more information, visit our website at visionarybasketball.com or drop into our new athletic performance center located at 152 Tremont Street, Melrose, Mass. VBG, complete your vision. Welcome back. It's not about the money, not about the bling, but Jacoby Ellsbury, yeah, it is about the money and he's going to get it. He's uh, in the top 10 in wins above replacement. He's hit really well after the beginning of the year. I know that Scott Boris is going to say he was hurt, so he had no power. He's got 46 out of 50 stolen bases. He's played good defensively. You know, he's really been exemplary after the first six weeks of the season. But I still, I would worry if I signed him for a five-year contract for $90 million, that he's going to be hurt for three years. I'm just looking, I'm looking into the future as a Yankee fan. <laughs> Gardner in left, Ellsbury in center, and Grandison in right. That'd be the best outfield in baseball. Yep. Best field, and the quickest outfield, the best fielding outfield. You'd have, you'd have, I mean, that would be unbelievable. You'd have great defense, no and question. To, hear a, to share a healthy, the Yankees will be back next year. And the Red As a matter of fact, they're making a run now. And, and the Red Sox are still somehow in first place here on August 22nd. I don't know how. Maybe it's 19 walk-off wins which you cannot expect that to continue. They get unlikely contributions from unlikely heroes. How many pinch hit home runs is Johnny Gomes going to hit this season? It can't keep happening, especially with the bullpen they have right now. They have two reliable guys. Uihar has been beyond spectacular, and Breslow throwing that slop up there gets people out. Tazawa is on the the downturn, workmen we don't know. Villarreal, his reputation is he can throw the ball 100 miles an hour, but he has nowhere it's go, no Farrell, idea where it's going. What was Farrell thinking about the other night? He goes, I, want, I wanted to save Uihara for if case we took the lead, I'd have him the close. Well, you got to get by this inning first. <laughs> You're bringing in a guy that averages one walk an inning. He, he's with back, bases loaded, two back outs. In, back when we were kids, the, the Cleveland Indians had a guy named Sam McDowell, sudden Sam McDowell. The guy would either strike you out or walk you. How about Ryan Doran? <laughs> well, Ryan Doran had the big Coke bottle glasses. Had no <laughs> idea where it was he going. He was the one pitcher that everybody was afraid to get up against because <laughs> they knew he didn't know where it was going. But you look at Farrell. What is he thinking about? I mean, some of these coaches and these managers. Number, you know, I, you know what I think about him. Early in the year, when it, you know, they're very aggressive on the base paths, the scoring runs. Now they've lost about four or five games in the last say, last month because of base running mistakes. You know, they've made some terrible base running moves, and, um, and they've lost games, and you don't hear anything. And then Farrell trying to, at first he says, well, I wanted to save Uihara if we score a run. Then he, he said that if I put Uihara in, he was the second, he'd be the second batter in the next inning, and I'd have to pinch hit for him. Well, why would, you know, then I wouldn't have him for the next inning. Well, you want to get out, you want to get out of that gym, because well, if you don't, you're, the game's over. They didn't have to worry about it. So they, they managed to save him for, for last night in a 12-1 to game. But quickly, we'll stay with baseball. But one thing I want to get in, I didn't say it, Popovich, the coach of the San Antonio Spurs, made the worst coaching decision 
in the history of all sports. He cost this team a championship, and it's unbelievable what he did because in that situation, not putting Duncan in the game at the end of the game and letting Bosch get the rebound and kick it to Allen for the three-point shot to tie the game in regulation, not putting Duncan in there, to cut, knowing that if they miss the shot, we've got to get the rebound, and that's when you get a wide-open three is off an offensive boards. I mean, to me, he blew it to San Antonio, and he's supposed to be a great coach. He probably can't even sleep, and here you are repiling on. No, but really, this is how great these coaches are. Like Farrell, you hear, you know, one thing about Farrell, though, Ron, every interview he's saying something, he's referring to him being a genius. Every interview, just listen to him. Well, you know, the way we, our at-bats are great, we, you know, we talk about, you know, take the first pitch. Well, what if a pitcher throws the ball down the middle well, of the first pitch? you know, it, I think it was around 10 days ago in the Sunday paper, Nick Cafardo, Boston Globe owned by the Red Sox and John Henry, Cafardo says, arguably the best team in baseball. Like, arguably, you're crazy. They're not even the best team in the American League. And they're certainly not the best team in baseball, but I understand if you're going to decide not on run scored or run differential or pitching or fielding or anything except, well, the boss does... Uh, actually own the team, so we better say something nice. How about the Dodgers? The Dodgers have Everybody been... Everybody knocked the Dodgers. For they, they have been on a historic run. They won 42 out of 51 games, which is incredible. Obviously, to start off the 1984 season, Detroit won 35 of the first 40, cruised from there, and won the World Series. But the Dodgers have just been crushing everybody, and who do the Red Sox play next? The Dodgers. Yeah, and they're missing their two top pitches. Well, that's... Kershaw pitched today a <laughs> shutout. And they're, they're going to be facing pretty good pitching, but not the top two. Well, the Dodgers have been crushing the ball. You know, Crawford's been productive. Gonzalez has been productive. Puig, everybody says the guy's flashing a pan. He's still hitting 350. He's a nut, though. They don't know <laughs> if he's going to last. He's crazy. He's drink, out drinking. He was with LeBron James when they were in Miami till 5 in the morning. Then they benched him because he came to the pack late. He's What's a, LeBron James doing with him? He's a young guy, so he can, he can handle it, Ralph. But you talk about LeBron James. What is, he, what is he, a knucklehead? He knows the guy plays for the Dodgers, and well, he's got him out till 5 in the morning, a young guy. Well, he probably wanted to make sure that he didn't play well against Miami. Now, James was talking about running for president of the Players Union, which fortunately he decided not to do. Paul got it, right? Yeah, and then they're, now they're talking about James talking about going back uh, – opting out of his contract in Miami and going back to Cleveland. <laughs> he's got one more year left? Right. Well, you know, he's going to be thinking, um, especially with the team they have now, Allen's going to be probably gone after next year. Right. Uh, but they'll always get – everybody wants to play with him. Well, so. and Wade is – his Wade's knees hurting. his knees are falling apart. And they lucked out because of that knucklehead Popovich. They should well, have never won. Here we are with about six weeks left in the regular season of baseball. Red Sox are a game up. I still think Tampa will beat them out. The Yankees are not out of it yet. In the Central Division, Detroit is in. I don't see Cleveland making no. a threat. And then Texas and Oakland are probably both well, going to get in. Oakland's in a slump. I know. But the Yankees may sneak in the second wild card. Can well, you believe, believe that? It, it's possible. But it's really important, obviously, to win your division because the wild card is a one-game winner-take-all. Yeah. That, which is, that's one of the few smart things baseball's actually done. It could be the Yankees and the Red Sox. Could be. You know, it could be. Who knows? The Yankees are maybe a little too late. Back like 1978. We all yeah. know how that turned out. <laughs> well, it's about time for high school sports, right? Fall sports, right? Why not? It was uh, tryouts began today for uh, volleyball, perhaps some of the other sports. I've seen the football team out practicing or, or trying out. And uh, for volleyball, it's a chance to bring a new, new club, the nucleus of the team has graduated after last year's state championship, but uh, you know, there's no reason to, not to expect continued success. Now, one point that some people like to make is, you know, you have a sport that's really successful, it, there's a history involved. Yeah, there's a history. It goes back to when I started watching sports, when my daughter started, um, Andrew Basteri, who's the freshman coach, was the um, captain and the star. The first, to me, the first time, you know, I, I watched volleyball. I mean, she was a superstar. She was the MVP of the league. She was tremendous. Like, I, you know, and I, I said she, she was right up there with your daughters and with Hannah Brickley as the best I've seen in the middle. And um, she was a great captain and went from there. I remember um, that 
class that came on, um, I, besides Coach Jelly, I, I give credit to Jack Hudd because he talked, he talked a bunch of the girls that were friendly with his daughter Erin into playing volleyball. They were going to swim. My daughter was going to swim. Mimi and Foley wasn't going to play, play um, volleyball. She, was, she ended up being MVP of the league. And Erin Hudd right behind her. And Denise Applegate, none of those girls were going to play volleyball. But because the Huds were playing, Erin's older sister played, instead of swimming, they tried out for the volleyball team. You know what happened. Their senior year, they went to the Final Four with your two daughters as sophomores. And then from there, it just the program just exploded. More players played Junior Olympics. Right. For, for, you know, it kind of goes back to uh, the 2000... I think it was 2001 season. Well, well, I think it was the 2002, 2003 season when they first made the playoffs, and they played against Drake in a kind of epic uh, three out of five five set match that must have outlasted for two and a half hours. The, the last game I think was 38, 36, or some some crazy number. But back then it was um, it wasn't. You know, three out of five sets, it was two out of three sets back then. But it was three out of five in the playoffs. Yeah, it right. was 30 points during the, during the regular season. You, right. You know, 30 instead of 25, but it was only two out of three, not three out of five. But in the playoffs, it went to five sets. And they were all juniors, and your daughters were freshmen. But then it basically just took off from there. And how many years in a row did they make the Final well, Four? Well, they've been to the, the sectional finals the last uh, 10, 10 years, which is incredible, including seven sectional, that is, Division II championships, the one state championship, and you know, numerous players have been all scholastic and all state now. Yeah, I mean, those, you know, to me, like, I was thinking about it, you know, like, when the, this team won the championship. I mean, the players, you don't hear much about the past teams. You know, basically, you just heard about, of course, the team that won the championship. Well, you the see, that, you know. But what... What got that program to where it was? Well, the great games that you can think of at the top of your head in, in uh, 2003 against Arlington Catholic. Arlington Catholic came in 22-0, uh, had not lost a, a single set. game, right, right, a single set the whole season. And then they, and they had two girls who were over 6-1. And, I mean, I'm sure they came in expecting to roll over Melrose. Well, that Marlboro coach who won the state championship said that a coach told him that when Melrose was going up against Arlington Catholic, the coach said, "My Arlington Catholic will win in three sets. We'll win three nothing over Melrose." Well, just the opposite <laughs> happened. You know, and it was it was a pretty solid victory. I mean, it wasn't a blowout, but it was Melrose, that Arlington Catholic too, wasn't it? No, it no, was it, was a, it was at Andover. Yeah. Unfortunately, they don't play at Andover anymore because the ceiling's too low. But real, that was an epic game. Certainly, when Barnstable came and played against uh, Colleen and Hannah's team uh, a few years ago, and, and Melrose beat Barnstable. Barnstable's won 13 state championships in Division I, and Melrose uh, beat them here. Since then, Barnstable hasn't been terribly enthusiastic about playing Melrose. But you know what I look at? What I look at over the years is Kerry Dillon was a great back row player. I mean, she was great. But I think the difference, I mean, Melrose has had unbelievable f players to play, to play the net. I mean, all, throughout the years, they've had great Whatever you would call Well, the basketball skills and translate well to volleyball. Outside hitters. But the passing is so much better. But, I mean, if they had a back row like they had last year, he would, Chelly would have four state championships. If he had that, I mean, he's had good back rows. Right. But he's never had a great back row. He's had some great players. But when you talk a great back row, you know, you had Jen Kane when she was in the back row. She was amazing. I never saw her bump the ball. You know, away from Brooks, you always got it to where Brook wanted the ball. And then you go with Jill McGinnis, who became a superstar, well, last Allie year, Nolan. Last year there were players who kicked the ball back into play. Almost every, every match you see uh, pancake digs where a, patient, a player is extended out. They have their hand down, the ball hits and bounces up in the air. They keep it alive. Play, plays that the players did not have enough experience to make it instinctively back in the yeah. day. And Amanda Cometo and... Um, and Cassidy Barber will play back there mostly. Oh, Those are the five Amanda that Amanda Camito made one out against uh, Westboro that you were, I mean, I yeah. think the officials missed the call because they just couldn't believe that it actually happened. But that back row with a great front court and Brooke and Seta, I mean, you put all that together, I mean, that's why they won the championship. Right, and they have to replace probably 500 kills this, this season with uh, uh, Rachel 
John Sarah Smith. McGowan, uh, Jen Kane, all graduating. Kayla. No, right, Kayla. So, I mean, they'll, they'll find players, but, it, you know, it may take a while to get the team into uh, full swing. But that back row is going to be a strong. Back row, have, back row will be tremendous. They have, the, well, two of the captains are back there, right? Jill McGinnis and Cassidy. Well, and Cassidy Barbro. And Cassidy's a captain, too? Right, I think so. And I know um, Allie Nolan's a captain. Right, and Cassidy, who kind of talk about biding your time. She was on a team for two and a half years, not getting a lot of action. And then this, the latter half of last year, she came on as a back row player and server. Dynamic player really made the difference in a number of games, especially Canton. Yeah, and they have a ton of players. I mean, DeBarry will be playing up front. You like uh, the girl you yeah, love. Mary from, Lessing, I think Mary she's going to be really like good. Her. There's going to be other girls popping up that are going to be, they, they know how important it is. They've all been working all year. I mean, this program right now, you know, Remember we talked about basketball last week, last show. I said that not enough's being done, you know, to, to maximize your chance of winning. Well, enough's being done in volleyball. More well, than enough is being done in volleyball. Well, I have a couple dozen players who are playing almost all year round. And there's no doubt that many players who previously devoted a lot of time to basketball have switched their allegiance and play more volleyball. And, and the skills have clearly developed. Yeah, I mean, it's just going to be it's going to be an interesting season, and you know we want to talk a lot about them. But quickly about the football team, football team. I'm looking for big things to happen. If that, again, an offensive and defensive line, that's where they're going to have to. Some of these young players are going to have to come through. But Eric Mercer and DeRaphael, you know, playing inside linebacker and a running back, both of them. I mean, there's a huge advantage there. Going to be tough up the middle with the two of them. And Eric, and then you have Zach Mercer who's going to be a star. Zach Morris is going to be as good as where DeRaphael was last year. Well, and they don't have to play Redding with uh, Drew Belcher, who's preseason all scholastic. Yeah, but then they have kids like McLaughlin, a bunch of those younger sophomores and juniors from last year. I can't name them all, but they're going to be talented again. You know they're going to be ready to play, and who knows, they may end up going to the Super Bowl this well, year. Well, it's going to be awkward with the new schedule. They're playing Wakefield twice. Theoretically, they could have to play Wakefield three times. Wakefield has a new football um, surface installed on uh, Landrigan Field. And I know the people in Wakefield are very excited about their new athletic facilities. So that'll be a good opportunity for, uh, I guess, the game. Is the game at Wakefield this year? I well, one of these. It's probably, since they're playing twice, they're probably playing. No, it's at home. Well, the, the Thanksgiving Day game will be home because last year I went to Wakefield and that was okay. that great game Melrose played. All right. Best coaching job I've seen Melrose in the years I've been watching them. They came in with an unbelievable game plan on defense and on offense, so hopefully that continues. And, um, well, I've enjoyed seeing you. I'm Ron Sen. And I'm Ralph LaBella, and thank you for watching Let's Talk Sports.